Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. Thanks for coming for another Carnegie Mellon Database Group seminar series. A talk. Today we're excited to have actually someone who was a visiting PG researcher with us many, many years ago. Yingjun Wu is the CEO and co-founder or founder of Rising Wave Labs, the, the company building the Rising Wave uh, streaming system he's going to talk about here today. Yingjun has been at a lot of places. Uh, he was also he was at Avido's Redshift. He was at IBM Research. He did his PhD at, uh, at National University of Singapore in databases. Um, and that's when he came to visit us at CMU. So we thank Yingjun for being here. And as always, if you have questions for, for Yingjun as he's given the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and feel free to do this anytime. We want this to be a conversation and not have Ying Jun talking to himself for an hour on Zoom. So Ying Jun, good to see you again, man. Thanks for being here. Okay, great, great. Thanks for having me here. So today I'll be talking about the rising wave. Um, the the title, yeah, is uh, reinventing stream processing in a cloud era. Yeah, I'm Ying Jun Wu, and I'm currently the founder of Rising Wave Labs. It's a startup. And before I started this company, I was a software engineer at AWS Redshift, a researcher at IBM Research Hamilton. And I obtained my, my PhD from National University of Singapore, and I was also a vision PhD at Cash Mellon University. The you, database group. You were you were with us for a year. We have a paper, and then yeah. you didn't ask me. You didn't ask me to be on your thesis committee. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because for the rule in NRS was that, okay, if you cause with my, uh, yeah, cause of my, any of my papers, then you cannot be in my committee. <laughs> because for the, we, we want to have some third party, right, to, to, to yeah, review the thesis. That's why I got right. Ellen, right? Ellen Fickett, yeah. Sure. Okay, go for it. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, actually, I was uh, pretty well known at CMUDB, right? And uh, one of my paper, yeah, this is a paper we, we caused, right? And the paper used to have a pretty nice titles, but the unfortunately the VLDB chairs didn't really like it, and uh, they threatened us to reject our paper unless we change the title. So, well, unfortunately, I have to save my PhD, right? So I have to I have to obtain my PhD, and Andy really want to get his tenure, so we have to surrender, right? And the second thing I, I was famous for uh, at CMUDB was that okay, I was actually uh, frequently blamed for the death of Peloton. And uh, Peloton, well, if you know this database system, well, it was actually the first self-driving database system built at Cameron Long University at the database group. But the project was actually abandoned two years, oh no, three years ago, right? It was abandoned in 2019. And many people, including myself, believe that the reason was because the, the project actually got the same name as a popular bike company, Peloton. But Andy insisted that way, uh, it was me that killed the project. He blamed me that okay, I didn't really write any test cases for it. But I, I still insist that okay, I actually wrote a lot of test cases and all my test cases can pass, even though the test cases doesn't really test anything. Right, but anyways, um, I was um, because I was uh, playing for the death of Peloton, and I know that probably I, I don't really get, get any chance to stay in academia, so I have to leave academia and join the industry. And now I'm currently running a company called the Riding Wave Labs. So it's a Riding Wave Labs is currently a Series A startup founded in early 2021. And we are currently building a, a system called a Rising Wave. It's a cloud-native SQL database for stream processing. And in this company, I'm the I'm the boss, right? So, and I'm super paranoid about well, the database testing. And we now have a very strong, dedicated testing team responsible for the for testing the uh, to to test the, the database. And thanks to the very strict testing. Rising Wave now is production ready, and it has already been deployed in several use cases. And actually, nowadays, well, to be honest, I'm I'm actually nowadays pretty quite famous for uh, database testing. And a few months back, I was actually uh, invited to join the DB test workshop at a Sigma conference um, to share my experience in building the uh, industry strength database systems with uh, strict industry strength testing. Um, 
So what is rising wave? Well, rising wave, well, I mean, I, I, I actually have so many keywords that can make a high, can get a high, right? It's an open source database. It's a Postgres compatible. It's SQL database, it's cloud native. It's, um, it's built from scratch in the Rust language. We actually have a blog describing how we can build a, how we can rewrite the entire system uh, uh, in Rust, right? But it's, um, I mean, the only thing you need to do, uh, you need to remember in, in today's talk is that okay, we are building a cloud native streaming database or a cloud native SQL database designed for stream processing. And it's definitely not a pitch talk. And right, so, so I will not tell you about, okay, how uh, I will not show you a demo about, okay, how great uh, Rising Wave is. But I will, I will describe a lot about the technical side of the system. And today, let's focus on the stream processing. Um, okay, actually, I don't really think that's right. I need to educate a lot about what stream processing is. Uh, conventionally, people use the batch systems to process data. What they typically do is to collect a large amount of data generated over a few hours or a few days, ingest them into the batch systems, such as um, Snowflake or Redshift. I used to work in Redshift. And I believe that the rest of it is actually better than Snowflake. And the wrong queries on top of them. And in this way, the result freshness can be as high as a few hours or even a few days, meaning that you, can, you cannot receive the result instantly as the data comes in, right? But batch systems are very good for, the, for doing a lot of things, such as reporting, data mining, machine learning. You can always do uh, use uh, uh, use batch system to do, let's say something like uh, data science, right? But the problem here is that okay, not everyone is happy with the batch processing, and many re many people nowadays really want to make decisions instantly based on the fresh results, and that's that's why we have the stream processing. Stream processing systems leverage the power of the incremental computation to lower latency from a few hours or even a few days to just a few minutes or even a few seconds. And instead of processing millions or even billions of tuples in batches, the streaming systems trigger the computation once the tuple is ingested into a system. And that is, every time a new tuple comes in, the stream processing system will re re refresh the results so that the users can always see the most recent results based on the most recent generated from the most recent data. And obviously, the lower the latency is, the higher the value, basic value we can get. With stream processing, we can do dashboarding, we can do monitoring, we can do alerting, right? We can, we can extract a lot of business insights from the real data, real time data, right? And we also want to ensure that the business value is high enough. But the problem here is that lowering the latency also indicates that the users may have to pay more money for it because, well, the, because well, it may cost more resource, right? And people really hate to pay more money. And that's why we build a system called a Rising Wave. Writing the writing wave is a system that can achieve low latency at low cost. The goal of building this system is not to is not to uh, build a system that is let's say ten times, one hundred times, or even one thousand times faster than existing systems, existing streaming systems like uh, Apache Samza, Apache Flink, or, uh, or whatever system it is. The goal is to make sure that really it can achieve cost efficiency. Okay, then how can we achieve cost efficiency? Well, you may consider that okay, probably we can put a writing wave into the cloud, leverage the cloud there, right? But instead of, um, I mean, before talking about the cloud, let's first discuss what, what cost is in the stream processing. We can think of this question from three dimensions. The first one is the normal execution. During the normal execution, during the stream processing a normal execution, we, can, we want, really want to achieve high performance. We really want to hypothesize means that probably low latency and high throughput, right? But can uh, consume as few resources as possible. And it doesn't really make sense for us to achieve low latency by consuming, let's say, one thousand machines or even one uh, ten ten thousand machines, right? And the second dimension is failure recovery. 
A stream processing means that it essentially means continuous query processing. A streaming database system needs to uh, a streaming system will need to continuously emit results to users, but the machine can fail, right? If the machine failure occurs, we don't really want to wait for a few hours until the uh, until the until the machine gets recovered, and we don't really want to redo all the computation from scratch. But uh, and what we really want to get is instant failure recovery. That is, I mean, if the machine uh, fails. We, we we probably can get a, uh, get recover from such kind of failure instantly without any latency uh, without any delay and the third dimension is elastic scaling well one of the one of the most uh, one of the most um, uh, most challenging scenario in the uh, in the um, in the stream processing is that where the workloads can fluctuate we may suddenly witness a workload burst right and when we come from workload burst, we want to scale out instantly to ensure that we, we, the system can sustain such a high, high, high workload burst, right? But if there's only a few tuple comps in, then we really want to shut down most of the machines to make sure that we don't really want to, uh, we don't really waste a lot of resource. And all these three dimensions actually uh, are related to a concept called the uh, key technology called the state management. So what is state management? And why do we need to manage the states? Well, this is because what we need to do the stateful stream process, uh, a stateful stream processing, where we need to maintain internal states for different operators, including the aggregations, group by, joins, window, or whatever, uh, or many other uh, operators. So that is, whenever you want to operate the data using aggregation group by drawing window or, and, this, uh, and many other operators, you have to do states for uh, stream processing. And let's just explain uh, what stream processing, uh, states for stream processing is using the very classic ad monetization example. So imagine that you have two streams. One is the ad impression stream containing the events where the ad was displayed to a user. And the, the other one is the ad click stream, which captures when the displayed ad was clicked by the user. To charge the user, you have to match which ad impression actually leads to a click. And in other words, you have to join these two streams based on a common key. And in this example, it's the ad ID because well, this is the unique identifier of each ad that is present in, uh, in the events of both streams. You need to join these two streams, and to to join uh, to to support such kind of uh, join operator, you will have to maintain two states in the streaming operator. And one is the hash table for the impression stream, and the other one is the hash table for the click stream. The uh, the stream uh, uh, every time a new table comes in into the impression impression stream, you will have to it will have to check whether there's a match in the hash table for the click stream. If there's a match, you have to emit a result. You, you have to emit an output, right? And similarly, if a tuple comes in from the click stream, you need to check whether there's a match in the uh, hash table for the impression stream. If there's a match, then you have to emit the result. And such kind of streaming operator must be fully elastic because well, as I mentioned, the workload can frustrate dynamically, right? And we have to scale in and not scale out the streaming operator based on the streaming workload. The problem here is that how we can manage these internal states to ensure that the uh, all stream processing can scale in and scale out elastically and can best leverage resource. How we can achieve high performance at very low resource consumption. How we can uh, how we can achieve faster failure recovery, and how we can achieve smooth elastic scaling. Well, to answer these questions, let's reverse the evolution of the streaming systems. Well, all friends uh, in in Sweden and in Netherlands they actually published a survey two years ago on the on the evolution of stream processing. And there are basically three stages as shown in this figure. There are basically three stages in the stream processing history. 
and I call the first stage as the single node error. In this error, researchers and the practitioners build the streaming systems based on a single machine. And in this stage, we witnessed a system like uh, Niagara CQ, uh, CQ, the Stanford Stream Project. And in, in commercial side, we saw the IBM System S, Oracle CQ, CQL, and uh, Microsoft uh, uh, streaming site, SQL Server streaming site. As Google published the MapReduce paper, people have already shifted their uh, people shifted their attention from building the single node streaming system to the distributed streaming systems. And I call this parallel as the big data era. And in this era, we witnessed the, the birth of all kinds of the streaming systems, including the Storm, the Samsa, uh, Spark Streaming, Flink, and many other popular streaming systems that are used in, uh, in, uh, in today's uh, environment. And as the cloud is becoming more and more popular, people have started investigating how to build a streaming system in the cloud. And we have already seen the systems like Ray, like uh, Archon, next Neptune. And actually, Riding Wave is one of them. So on today's topic, is, uh, let's focus on the state management. Let's first think about how we can manage the states in a single node error. In a single node error, what we have is only just a single machine, right? If we want to build a streaming system, then the only resource we can leverage is just a single machine. To support, uh, to support stream processing, to support continuous uh, stream processing, the only way we can maintain a state, the only place we can maintain a state is on the uh, local, ca lo local memory or the local disk. We have to put all the state, uh, internal state there. And the state limit is, uh, uh, the state size is actually limited by the memory size as well as the disk size. If we confront the workload burst, then what will happen? Okay, the, uh, the state size will increase. But if the state size keeps increasing, we will find that we'll, and uh, the keeps increasing and hits the hits the memory size or the hits the hits the uh, hits the disk size. Then what will happen? Okay, the only thing that will happen is that okay, the system will crash. We will see boom, it seems to just like run down and we can no longer process any uh, any data there. This is quite unfortunately uh, unfortunate, and. But what we can do, what we what we can do in a big data era, in a big data era, we have more machines. We have probably ten machines. We have probably one hundred machines, or probably even one thousand machines in our local cluster, right? And in the big data era, the node, also called a machine, is actually the minimum resource unit. If we run out of compute or the stored resource. The only thing we need to do is to just add more machines, right? So given these characteristics, most of the systems built in this area adopts the so-called uh, coupled compute and storage architecture, which means that the compute actually moves along with the storage. And using this architecture, we can do so-called the embarrassingly parallel execution. If you, are, if you are not quite familiar with this term, well, this term was actually invented during the, uh, I think he believed that well, it's invented during, uh, during the big data uh, um, uh, MapReduce era, right? Um, if we want to adopt this, uh, if we use this architecture, we have to do the embarrassing parallel execution, which means that okay, we can maximize the performance by sharding our data into different machines and process the data locally. So even this kind of, uh, back to this example, the, the meta edmonization example. If we observe that more events come in just in a sudden, then what we'll do is to add more machines, shuffle the streams, and then process the streams in different machines. Well, we can definitely scale in and scale out elastically by sharding the data and uh, by sharding the state and put them into different machines and process them, uh, process them in there. But the problem here is that the resource utilization can be super low. And this is because we're adding one machine, one or more machines. It actually means that we, can, we, are, we are adding more both the storage and the computer resource. 
Okay, any question? Uh, what do you, how do you change Sean? Ben, ben do, you want to, do you want to meet yourself? Yes. Um, if data scale changes over time, like more data comes in or data expires through retention, how do you change the shard count and change the number of nodes in the cluster? Well, in the big data era, I believe that's really the thing we'll do is that, okay, um, so first first thing is that uh, if, if it was five years ago or 10 years ago, the, uh, the thing we'll do is that okay, we can manually change the change the uh, our Java code. In the Java code, we can actually identify, okay, the number of parallel we want to get. So that's okay, we can, we can do the reshuffle. And, um, and there are a lot of research and as well as some, uh, and I, I believe that's where a lot of industry uh, projects also implement that. They will they will actually measure okay how many machines I really want. They will estimate how many resources I really want and the shadow machines uh, uh, and the shadow data based on the number of machines estimated estimated number of machines we want to get. Yeah. Can you change it after the fact or only at initial stream creation time? Uh. At the initial creation time, we can we can set a number of parallelism. Um, that was and uh, that was po quite popular in many systems like uh, Apache uh, Storm and uh, also Flink and uh, or even uh, uh, Apache Spark streaming. Uh, but for I, nowadays, right? Believe that's okay. Most of the system can support dynamic scaling. Yeah. So that means that I, we, you probably do not really need to set it beforehand. I thought, again, I, I mean, Ben's asking how how do you do that? How do you handle this now? Okay, now. Now we don't really need to handle that because we, I mean, um, okay, so this is just a, a big data error, but so for us, well, what do we do is that we will basically, uh, basically monitor the monitor the state size and decide whether we want to spare, uh, uh, spare the state or not. Yeah. Make sense? Keep, keep All right. Going. Okay, okay, cool. So yeah, basically, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, okay, in the big data era, the problem here is that the resource utilization rate uh, can be super low. And because, well, I mean, every time you add more machines, it actually, it do not just add only the storage uh, resource or only the computer resource. Yeah, actually adding both the storage and computer resource. And it's really super hard for us to uh, consume all the resources provided by, by, by these machines, right? And hence comes the resource waste. And now let's talk about the uh, cloud era. So with the cloud, well, in the cloud, what do we, uh, what do we see is that okay, the, the compute and storage resource are actually managed separately. And in the, let's say in the, in the AWS, we can, we can have both the, the EC2 and the F3, right? And the EC2 is actually the computer resource and the S3 is the storage resource. If we run out of computer resource, then what we can do well, we can we can just buy more computer instances, and what if we run out of storage resource? Well, the good thing is that we will never run out of cloud resource, uh, storage resource in the cloud, because well, in most of the cloud, let's say AWS, in GCP, in Microsoft Azure, the storage resource can scale automatically, so we'll never need to worry about when uh, whether uh, uh, yeah we will run out of the storage resource. So. Given such kind of architecture, we can now design the uh, uh, adopt the so called decoupled computing and storage architecture. So what do you mean is that okay, we can essentially build an execution engine on top of the cloud storage, so that where the compute and the storage can scale in and out in, independently and infinitely. So back to the um, the uh, the atomization example. So the naive solution in the cloud era was to maintain uh, where, where to maintain a state. Well, the naive solution is just to maintain the state in the remote cloud storage, right? We can just put this all the state and into the uh, and insert them into the S3 bucket. And if we run out of computer resource, then we can just add more machines, just add more EC2 machines. And all these EC2 machines can see the can can see the S3 data, right? So that can, we we can uh, we can quickly distribute the work, uh, computation workload into different machines. And what if we run out of storage resources? As I mentioned, that okay, we will never need to worry about whether we will run out of S3 resources because we're S3 will automatically scale scale out itself. 
But the problem here is that it's not realistic to build such kind of to adopt such kind of uh, uh, naive solution. And the key problem here is that okay, if we put all the states, uh, internal states into the remote storage, let's say the S3, then we'll find that the state transmission will become the remote access, which means that every time we want to read or write data, the 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 data in the in the in the internal state then we have to trigger a remote access from R2 to the S3. And S3 is super slow. So that uh, and is too slow to support low latency processing. If you want to check the uh, S3's documentation, from uh, AWS S3 documentation, you will find that through this, uh, AWS claim that the latency can be as high as uh, uh, actually 100 or even 200 milliseconds, right? Let's say that's true. If you want to process 10 tuples in just one second, then in the worst case, you may have to wait two seconds to process all the to, to, to finish processing all these 10 tuples, right? Which can be super expensive. And the second problem here is that S3 is actually charged based on, uh, on a per request basis, which means that every time you get a data or put a data from a two S3. You will be charged by S3. Uh, you, you will be charged by AWS, and I don't really want to. Uh, uh, and it, it, I believe that nobody will really want to pay AWS so much money, right? Then what do we can do? Well, definitely, we have uh, uh, the the lucky thing is that okay, we can have uh, we can maintain the data in different services. Because AWS essentially provides us with different services, such as EC2, EBS, and S3. So EC2 can be can be actually viewed as a as so-called a volatile storage. It's super fast, right? It's um the, the disk is local disk. It, it can be the NVMe SSD, right? It's super fast. But the data will uh, will get lost if it's not re well replicated. And we got S3. S3 is persistent storage. It's super slow, as I mentioned. That okay, the latency can be probably a hundred millisecond or even two hundred millisecond, but it's persistent storage. It provides eleven nice durability. And in the middle of EBS, uh, EC two and S three, we have the EBS, and the EBS can be considered as a semi persistent storage. It's fast enough, but it only provides five nice durability. Which means that really, I mean, it is still not uh, the persistent storage, but EBS is good enough for us to pro, uh, to 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 cache some data. So, given these services of different characteristics, what we can do is that okay, we can use the so-called Elson tree structure to maintain the internal states in different storage medium. So. The, the Ericsson tree stands for the, I mean, if you're not familiar with this uh, terminology, then Ericsson tree stands for lock structure merge tree. It's actually their structure typically used for dealing, uh, dealing um, with the red heavy workload. And given this kind of architecture, once the streaming data is ingested into the streaming service, it will not be directly persisted into S3. And instead, it will be written into EC2. And periodically, the data will be compacted into low level, uh, into into a lower level medium, which is the EC2 uh, e EBS. And I mentioned EBS is fast enough to serve as a cache between the hard data uh, between the EC2 and uh, and S3. And eventually, the EB EBS data will be further compacted into S3, which is the persistent, which is the key, a uh, true persistent storage. So well, I mean, it's quite straightforward to think of uh, to 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 come up with this such kind of architecture, right? But what's the key difference between the big data solution and the cloud solution in the in the stream processing systems? That is, what's the key difference between the coupled computer storage architecture and the decoupled computer st uh, storage architecture? I mean, in the in the compute coupled computer storage architecture. What we do is that we will maintain the states, the internal states in the compute nodes. And to ensure that we can instantly recover from the failures, we will periodically checkpoint the states into, into the persistent storage. 
But in the couple uh, in the decoupled compute and storage architecture, the state itself is essentially persisted in the persistent storage. And what we did to optimize performance is to add in a caching layer at the compute node or between the compute nodes and the and the persistent storage to make sure that the, uh, the performance is fast enough. And in this way, if we can store the state in the persistent storage, essentially the state itself can be served as a checkpoint because we can always leverage multi-versioning to ensure that we can we can we can we can reload the we can reload the state, right? So what's the what's uh, what's the uh, difference between these two architectures? Let's talk about well, okay. What what do we, what if we only have what what do, uh, let's let's talk about just to think of okay. What if the internal state is small enough? Well, if the internal state is small enough, then what we'll find in the decoupled computing and storage architecture is that the state can be fully cached in the local in a local disk, right? If that's the case, then essentially these two figures are equivalent. Are most likely, uh, I mean, you can consider it like equivalent, especially in terms of the performance, because all the data, all the internal states can be cached in the states, and there will be no cache miss there. So that okay, we can always load the data from the load the data from the local disk and the, uh, and make sure that the we can achieve low latency during the query processing. But what's the, uh, what if we are trying to handle the big state? Then here comes the difference. If the big uh, if the state is big enough, then as I mentioned, well, I mean, if we adopt the decoupled compute and storage architecture, then we don't really need to do anything to maintain uh, as the as the state grows, but in the but if we want to adopt the coupled computer and store, storage architecture, if the and the if the state is big enough, we have to provision many machines to ensure that all the states can be maintained in the compute nodes, and here comes the uh, resource waste. And what about the failure recovery? If we adopt a decoupled, uh, if we adopt a coupled computer and storage architecture, then failure recovery can be straightforward. I mean, yeah, kind of straightforward. Let's assume that okay, this machine uh, fails due to some, yeah, due to some accident, right? The thing we'll do is that we will reload, uh, 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 recover from a uh, reload state from the checkpoint, from the persistent storage, and recover from the from that checkpoint. But how can we handle failure recoveries when we adopt a so-called decoupled computing and storage architecture? In this case, as we mentioned, the state is essentially a checkpoint. If this machine gets crashed, then we do not really need to reload anything from the, uh, from, uh, from the storage, from the persistent storage. We can directly persist, uh, uh, start processing the data because the compute node the new compute node can directly read uh, read from the remote state, right? Can read the uh, lost state from the remote storage. And what about the elastic scaling? Let's assume that okay, we want to scale in this machine from one machine to three machines. We want to scale out, scale out well, right? Then, as I mentioned, the thing we'll do is that we will, we will partition the state, shuffle the state into three machines. And then route a, uh, route a new tuple into uh, into state uh, into these three machines, and then process the uh, process a state there, right? But if we adopt the so-called coupled compute and storage architecture, things will change. We do not need to do such kind of shuffling, because all the state is essentially can be can be uh, can be fetched from the remote storage, and the old machine only maintains a cache. We do not need to do some any anything like state migration because all these states can be directly loaded from the remote storage. So what's the key? Uh, what's the uh, challenging problems we confront when implementing such kind of architecture? Well, there are actually several several challenging uh, challenging questions for us. The first one is the LSM tree compaction. Well, let's rethink. Uh, let's rethink this architecture. This we we maintain the internal states in an S3 architecture, and we need to periodically compact the data 
from S3, uh, from, from EC2 to EBS, and then from EBS to S3. The problem here is that compaction can result from the drops. And people may argue that probably we can uh, uh, use something like remote compaction or Lambda function to offload the compaction workload into remote machines. But we have already done a lot of experiments and found that it doesn't really work. Because anyways, you have to, uh, uh, anyways, to do uh, to to uh, ship the data to ship the data from your local machine to remote machine, or to do any compaction, you have to incur the CPU usual, uh, you you have to incur high CPU utilization rate, which will influence the uh, stream processing performance. Right, so we still need to fine tune the compaction mechanism to ensure that the compaction will, will not trigger huge performance drop. And second challenge problem come from is the cache maze. As we mentioned, EC2 and EBS only, will only hold a cache, right? But if, uh, if we cannot find the data in this cache, we have to go for the S3, right? And the S3's latency is super high. Well, how can we, how can we, uh, how can we mask, uh, mask out these high latency from the customers or from the users? In Rising Wave, we do two things. The first one is out of order processing, which means that okay, if you want to process two, two tuples, and essentially we can change the order of processing these two tuples, right? And second thing we did is that, uh, is that we actually overlapped a fetching from S3 with the computation. Mean that the I mean the user will not be aware of such kind of S3 latency because we anyways we will do some computation over time. Okay, and so search is this like coroutines or you just mean you have one threads one threads doing computation one threads block waiting for the request? Yeah, yeah something like that. yeah 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 okay. yes, yes, right, yeah yeah because where you have to fetch from the fetch from S3 right so from from remote so it's not quarantine yeah. Just make sure okay yeah. And such a challenge we come from is that how we can implement so-called a status uh, status checkpoint, right? I mean, if if the state serves as a checkpoint, it essentially means that we have to maintain multiple versions for the state, right? Because, I mean, you have to ensure that you can recover from the failure, right? And we can we have to reload the previous state. From the checkpoint, right? So uh, I believe there are some several questions, right? Yeah, Kriti, you want you want to meet, uh, meet yourself and ask your question? Uh, yep. Uh, so my question was: if a computation is uh split across multiple compute instances, and in that case, is there a need to uh share the state? For example, the hash table would need to be shared between uh, different compute instances working on the same joint query. In the computer instance, right? Well, I mean, um, uh, I think well, it totally depends on how how you define sharing. I mean, um, in terms of, uh, I mean, so the different. Um, let me go back to. Yeah. Uh, let me let me go back. Okay. Anyways, yeah, I, I can I can use this slide. So basically, these two machines will not share the state. Uh, will not share the computation. They will do. Uh, I mean, they were they were. Uh, then the computation is still different. I mean, they process different different data, but they have the same view of the internal state. I mean, they have the global view of the internal state, state right? Say that okay, we have the let's say in the state we have three uh, three uh, three numbers one two three right? Machine A can see one two three, and machine B can see still see one two three. Yep. Right. They have the global view of the state, but they still process different tuples. I mean. In state A, we can process number one, uh, the data A, uh, data data one, and in this uh, in machine B, we can process data B, uh, data two, right? So, uh, can the one two three in the state change to one two three four? Yeah. So, so basically, yeah. If you want to change, uh, if you insert a four, then yeah, it will persist into the into the checkpoint, uh, into the remote storage, right? So, yeah. in mm -hmm. in that case, the update would need to be propagated to every instance that has a cache locally. Oh, okay, okay. okay so yeah, how about the cache? No, no, it will not be replicated. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, replicated into different caches because, well, I mean, as I mentioned, well, if you have a four, if you have a four, yeah. 
these machines will still process uh, data one, and this uh, machine will still process data two. And I maybe see. in this machine, it will process data three and four, but four will not exist in this. In the other two. Machines. Okay. Yeah. So that means that the sharding strategy that I have decided before I start my query computation, I have to stick with that no matter how much data I see. So for example, I can suddenly start seeing a lot of lot more of fours and threes. So the third machine will have to like, would want to offload some of its work. So is that a uh, valid concern? Uh, so if you, uh, yeah, so so basically your, your question is that what do, we, what do we sometimes see a lot of faults comes in, right? I mean, in this case, well, I mean, we have to spill out, uh, mm, so let's go back to, yeah, let's go back to, yeah, this slide. So basically we want to scale, scale out this machine. The strategy is not, um, I mean, uh, the strategy is not to split the cache here because all the states can be found here, found in the persistent storage. So the only thing we need to do is okay. to reload the data from the, uh, reload the storage from the persistent storage instead of, okay, shuffling the cache. Splitting the cache, we do not split the cache. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I think well, yeah, there are some of our engineers here uh, helping us to. Uh, okay, anyways. Mm, okay, where well, am? Um, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So back to this slide. So how to implement a state as uh, uh, state as a point? It means that okay, we have to we have to make sure that okay, we have we maintain multiple versions. We can still find the old versions, right? We uh, so that okay, once the machine fails, we can still reload the exact checkpoint we really want. Uh, we we want get from the uh, from the from the person storage, right? So we adopt to implement this. We actually adopt a multi version control, and we use the epoch uh, to identify ver versionings. Yeah, I will not go deeper into okay, how we can implement the M uh, MVCC okay, here. Um, all right, so the summary here is that okay, the key idea what we adopt in building writing web is to leverage so called the decoupled compute and storage architecture. And there are two strategies. The first one is that okay, we can adopt the remote storage to maintain the internal state. And the second one is that okay, we can add a caching layer to reduce the latency. Well. The question here is that whether it's a new idea. Well, to be honest, it's definitely not a new idea. The same idea has already been explored 10 years ago. If you read a blog, I mean, 10 years ago, the most popular database system, uh, I mean, the most popular streaming system in the world was called Apache Storm. And if you read a, read a blog from Nathan, you will find that Trident essentially implements this architecture. It adopts uh, it as a primitives to do uh, for doing stateful incremental processing on top of any database or person store. And it, at, uh, inside of Google, they also have two systems. One is the mail wheel, and the other one is the data flow. And data flow is actually uh, uh, you can consider like a build on top of mail uh, mail wheel. It's actually the next generation of mail wheel. Both of these systems uh, use a big, a big table as the external state uh, to to maintain the external uh, to maintain the internal state. So essentially, they still in uh, they they still adopt the um, I mean the remote store uh, rem they still adopt the remote store storage to maintain the internal states. But. If you read this paper, but uh, six years ago, um, uh, LinkedIn folks were published a blog, which is also quite influential in the in the streaming world. They published a blog called uh, "Stream Processing Hot Problems Part Two: Data Access," and they call this remote store idea as the traditional model for building applications, and the local store idea as the, the not the traditional model. They call it as a new idea. And afterward, they propose uh, they published a paper called SAMSA. And in this paper, they uh, they claim that in this uh, in their uh, in in SAMSA, they can handle state uh, they can handle states efficiently, improving latency and throughput by more than one hundred times compared to using a remote storage. 
So what you can find here is that okay, essentially before the big data era, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, probably 15 years ago or, or 10 years ago, what we have is that okay, we want to maintain, uh, people are talking about, we want to maintain a state in most stores. And five years ago, people started thinking about, okay, we want to maintain a, store, a state in the local stores. And most recently, we found that probably the local storage is still not the best place to maintain a state. We still want to maintain a state in the remote storage. And why this happens? Why don't the existing popular streaming systems such as um, Samsung or Flink adopt the idea? I believe that it's all about the cost. You know why? Because if you think of the data processing systems we, we built five or 10 years ago, you will find that there's no S3, there's no EBS, there's no E2. I know that's well, okay. I mean, at least well, it's not that popular okay, at the time. So if we want to build such kind of scalable caching uh, service or the persistent, uh, storage, uh, storage, uh, persistent storage service, we have to build a system, build a uh, services on our own. And we have, uh, as a company, we have to eat a cost. We have to, we have, uh, we ourselves have to build such kind of, kind of complicated system. That's why they decided to man just maintain the state in their local machines, so that to so as to achieve the high high scalability. But in the cloud era, things can uh, things can are totally changed. In the cloud era, the cloud infrastructure essentially offers of of to maintain the states in two different services, and they have already have provided us a service. And in the in the cloud, you can imagine that the resource is unlimited. Given this, the thing we the ob objective we uh, we want to achieve is not to maintain, uh, is not to achieve low latency, is not to is not just to achieve low latency, is not just to achieve high scalability, but to achieve high efficiency, high resource uh, low uh, high resource utilization rate, even high uh, uh, to to achieve high performance and and low latency and high scalability. Yeah, that's why we build a. That's why we build a rising waves from scratch. That's why we we don't really adopt any existing system. We be, we don't really build rising waves uh, on top of any existing systems. Okay, yeah, that's all my talk. And again, well, rising wave is a cloud system. So if you want to try out rising wave cloud, you can you can just uh, check out the uh, rising wave cloud and insert your invite code pattern to get an uh, early access. Yeah, we will have a manual check here and whether uh, see where we will input the invite code. And ResinWave is also under Apache license, so that okay, you can definitely try out in our own machine or your own clusters. Okay, thanks for yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, question. Okay, so I will applaud that for everyone else. Um, we have plenty of time. If the audience has any questions for you, you go go for it. Hey, my name's uh, Doug. I'm not a student or an alumni, but I, I have a question. Um, as more projects are embracing decoupling compute and storage, which I think has come up in a few of these sessions now, um, I find myself remembering something from Joe Armstrong along the lines of like, why not just send a small program to the data? And I wonder if the pendulum can be swinging too far in the other direction. Like when I hear about the compaction challenges you're having, I wonder if there's merits in the storage layer having some computation. Um, and like, I can see that being a lot easier on something like open EBS, but virtually impossible with AWS EBS. So do, do you feel like your choice of cloud technologies constrains your architecture in that sense? Um, so basically, um, yeah, the question you have essentially, uh, uh, essentially that okay, whether we can leverage the so-called computational storage, right? right. Um, so actually, there are several. Um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely public. But um, uh, yeah, when I was in Redshift, there was a project called uh, um, I forgot the name, but so we we leveraged every PJ. Well, if you check the AWS doc, Redshift doc, you will find that okay, essentially it leveraged every PJ to accelerate aqua. processing. Yeah, Aqua. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Yeah, essentially it leveraged the FPGA to accelerate query processing. But the problem here that okay. 
AWS doesn't really offer uh, that kind of capability to the to the users, to to the customers, right? To our customers or to to vendors like us, right? So essentially, it's not quite possible to for us to adopt such kind of um, uh, power like FPG uh, FPGA accelerated storage, right? To do query processing. So we have to use the conventional um, resources such as um, EP, uh, EC2, right? Um, so I mean, I think that's uh, that's a privilege of the of the cloud vendors that they 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 have they have the power. So I mean, if you have the FPG, then you can uh, yeah probably that can be leveraged by AWS, but probably not us, right? That's the that's a problem because well, yeah. AWS own, definitely own the own the hardware. We do not that's own the. Hardware. S3 does expose some filters, but I suspect it's not the filters, like it's too simplistic ah. for what you're what you what you what you're trying to do here. You're not trying to read data, like a bunch of data that's on S3, like Redshift or Snowflake's trying to do. You're trying to maintain you know state for your your for your golf filters. And uh, I yeah. yeah, actually that kind of functionality is called really um a feature called S3 Select. So S3 Select, well, I've not checked S3 Select for a while, but uh, S3 Select was designed for the, I mean, for Parkway uh, or for for um, a C, a CSV uh, format. Uh, but in our system, while well, the in, internal state is still maintained in our own format, because well, I mean, we want to uh, make, make sure that the the data is, uh, I mean, the data processing is fast enough, right? Um, but we we do support. I mean, if the data is persisted in our database, we do support dump, uh, yeah, uh, converting the state into. I mean, maintain the state, uh, maintain the data in open format. That's possible. But I mean, S3 Select is still quite slow compared to. Uh, I mean, your uh, your your own state format, right? Your, your own format, right? So I think uh, I, I still do. Because of the performance reasons, yeah, we do not adopt that. Yeah, I have a question about your storage tier. So, from looking at the slides for your storage tier, it kind of sounds like your the the backing store for your state on your storage tier is EBS. Did you guys notice a difference between EBS and like using SSDs instead for your storage tier nodes? Uh, okay. So, uh, good question. So, essentially, we uh, also we do not have this layer. I mean, the first uh, um. The first version of Rising Wave doesn't really have the EBS support. Um, we only have the EC2 and the S3, and we leverage a local. Uh, so the first version we did that. Okay, okay. Actually, the version version zero point one was that okay, every uh, all the data is maintained in the, in the cache, and the version of zero point two was to okay um, to allowing the allow allowing uh, the machine to uh, allowing the computation to spill the state into the local disk. But the local state, uh, local disk is still, I mean, uh, large enough, right? So we have to adopt the EBS. So that's the, that's the main reason. Yeah, um, EBS is it's actually fast enough, uh, and I think really, I mean, uh, it's quite reasonable to have the tier storage uh, to maintain a tier storage there. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A more, do you have a question? Yeah. Um... Hi, Yingjin. So uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that, uh, you know, Rising Wave is Postgres compatible. So I was wondering sort of, is SQL the language that you use uh, to query this and what what portion of SQL do you support right now? Like uh, okay. In particular, multi-way join. I was kind of curious about if you support more than two-way joins. Uh, I mean, well, it means that well, it's uh, Postgres well, uh, well protocol compatible. I mean, we implement the well protocol same as Python. Um, I actually struggle a lot in implementing uh, PG while in in Python. So uh, it means that okay, I mean, every time, uh, as long as your client can talk to uh, PG Postgres, you can talk to our database system because we speak in the same language. We speak, you know, we we adopt the same protocol that is PG while protocol, um, and the semantics is also the same. Yeah, so. I'm not sure where, where what, what, what is what is the SQL dialect though? A PG, yeah, Postgres, yeah. It's, it's, it's Postgres Wire Protocol plus the Postgres SQL dialect, grammar. That's right, right, that's yeah, right. Okay. But we do not build on top of Postgres. Yeah, I know that's right. Some 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 database that we build on top of Postgres, for example, Redshift, right? But we sure. uh, we build from scratch in Rust. Yeah. Okay. 
But but Amol was also asking like again what how much of Postgres do you actually support then of like of their of their C like do you support multi way joins? Uh, multi way joins will the I mean we we can support will the definitely the uh, the general cases we we can definitely support that. But for for I'm not sure whether well what kind of joins you want to have like join more than two tables. Uh, we we can we we have that yeah we have that but I mean in terms of the detailed uh, detailed implementation such as well whether we want to have binary joins or whether we want to have multiple joins I think it totally depends on the optimizers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Again, again, it's not SQL doesn't specify that. I understand. Yeah, but, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. Any other questions? Oh, I think well the. I think there was a question if. If I want to choose one to two papers to read and uh, to read, to understand what is unique about writing way of architecture, what paper you want? <laughs> um, I haven't written any paper for a long time um, after I graduated, and <laughs> but um, I mean we were uh, we were thinking about well, okay writing a uh, paper and submitting to uh, the industry track if possible, probably in, uh, probably early next year, probably. Very Actually, yeah. Victor, it doesn't, it's not specific to Rising Way, but I think a bunch of the papers he listed in the talk were the yeah. Bill paper, Dataflow, SAMSA paper. There's enough. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah basically the, the theory behind it, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think there are a bunch of papers we'll talk about for the uh, stream processing, how to maintain a states, right? Um, yeah, yeah the mill wheel and data flow is definitely one. Well, uh, uh, definitely one. Well, uh, yeah, one of them, right? And uh, there are several other papers. Like, uh, I, I believe that's okay. Um, there, there, there are several papers from TU Berlin, right? Uh, yeah, they wrote very good surveys about stream processing. Yeah. Yeah. For, for example, timely data flow or things like that. What, what is the really the main theory behind it? Uh, yeah, so so, timely data flow. We we didn't we didn't really implement a timely data flow. I mean, um, so the so uh, this is actually this is related to my my last question. My last question is like, you know, the early stream processing stuff that you showed in the two thousands. That was sort of groundbreaking and setting up like, here's the algorithm, the method you use for like doing these sliding window computations and maintaining the staple operators. Um, and then to the NIAD paper in particular, I think that's that was you know just a different approach to this problem as well. Millwell to some extent, but that was more about the architecture. Like, what do you see that is is different that like this rising wave is doing it in terms of the algorithms and methods for computing these again, these window functions or sliding window functions, or is it just the the unique aspect is the decoupling of the of the of the storage of compute? Well, we do not adopt any any unique computation uh, algorithms. For example, hey, you mentioned uh, you mentioned timely data flow and uh, okay, differential data flow. So I think well, though. I mean, if you if you check the background of these papers, well, they are mostly designed for the uh, unifying the batch processing, uh, batch processing, stream processing, uh, incremental computation, and the graph computation. It was published in 29, uh, 2012, I think. Uh, but well, I mean, we were not focusing on um, those applications, and we are more focused on the, I mean, SQL because well, we believe that okay, um, the problem here is that okay, it's not about the expressiveness of the uh, of the database system. The problem here is that the cost of this system. So yeah, to answer your question, we do not really ad adopt any unique, very unique uh, uh, computation algorithms or uh, computation architectures. But uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, you, um, uh, uh, yes. Uh, the yeah, the right. the yeah, but the I mean, the, mm -hmm. the contribution is the engineering. That's the, the, en the engineering of the in the cloud. Yeah, that's the yeah, that's that's, that's, a, that's a unique characteristic of the of the yeah unique part of the system. Yeah. Got it, okay.